from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I am Carolyn Brown. I'm the director of the Office of Scholarly Programs here at the library in the John W. Kluge Center. And I am delighted to welcome you here this afternoon uh, for a lecture by Professor Benjamin Fordham, who uh, this year is the Kissinger Chair in Foreign Policy and International Relations. The title of his talk is Protectionist Empire, Trade, Tariffs, and U.S. Foreign Policy, 1890 to 1914. Before we begin, I'm going to ask you to please turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices um, so they don't go off during the talk or interfere with the recording. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Kluge Center, uh, which was established through a very generous endowment by John W. Kluge, uh, with the idea of supporting the world's most accomplished senior scholars and some of the most promising junior scholars to conduct advanced research uh, in the library um, and where possible uh, to enable our senior scholars to have informal uh, conversations with members of Congress. Uh, the center further promotes the scholarly enterprise through lectures such as this one, seminars, small conferences and such. Um, I urge you, if you're in the Washington area and are usually interested in such things, uh, to sign up for email notification of the events. Uh, not quite as easy as it used to be, but if you go to the front page of the library's, library's page on the right-hand side, scroll down to um, Kluge Center, you'll get the Kluge page, and then at the bottom of the page you can sign up for notifications. Um, I've also provided um, in the back of the room copies of our new brochure, which also gives you an overview of the programs and how to stay in touch should you wish to. Now on to the business at hand. Dr. Benjamin Fordham is the 10th Kissinger Chair at the Library of Congress. Um, he follows a line of very distinguished scholars. I won't mention them all, but I'll mention some of them. Aaron Friedberg, who was our first Kissinger Chair, Klaus Laris, Lan Xin Shang uh, and Melvin Leffler, um, who have all held this position. The, the chair is an endowed chair, endowed by the friends of Henry Kissinger, uh, Dr. Kissinger, um, because of his sense of the great importance of these areas, foreign policy and international relations, their importance for uh, the country and for the country's future. Uh, Dr. Fordham, um, is I think the first Kissinger uh, scholar to actually focus his attention on the relationship between U.S. domestic economic issues and U.S. foreign policy. Um, as he himself notes, and I'm quoting here, during the 25 years preceding World War I, the United States became increasingly active in world politics, acquiring overseas colonies, building a battleship fleet, and more often flexing its diplomatic and military muscle. The widespread belief that access to foreign markets was necessary for the country's prosperity contributed to this foreign policy. But the continuing effort to protect the home market from foreign competition also inf influenced in important and overlooked ways. None of this, I think, comes to, to any of us who follow the newspapers as a surprise. But what is surprise, surprising is that um, uh, not as much attention has been given to some of these things as one would have thought. Um, and, but uh, uh, Ben Fordham actually has been giving attention to it, and we are the beneficiaries of that. Um, he has worked on related issues before with a focus on a later period. He is the author of the book, Building the Cold War Consensus, The Political, Political Economy of U.S. National Security Policy. 1949 to 1951, um, and has published a, a large number of articles on the role of domestic economic performance in, this, uh, in decisions uh, on use of military force, the effect of party differences on policy choices about the use of force, 
in the allocation of the military budget in the U.S. and on the influence of economic interests on congressional voting uh, with respect to matters of foreign economic and security policy. Um, I may have said that too fast, but I don't want to take a lot of time because um, you are here to listen to Dr. Fordham when he's not at the Kluge Center as the Kissinger Chair. He's Professor of Political Science at Binghamton University, um, which is part of the state system of New York, um, and is also taught at uh, University of Albany and Harvard University. So, we're about to learn a lot about political economy as it affects U.S. foreign policy. Please welcome Benjamin Fordham. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. And I want to thank uh, the whole staff at the Kluge Center for uh, creating a really great place to do research. It's not just the fabulous resources that we have here at the Library of Congress, but also the unusual opportunity for someone who works at a university to have a whole lot of uninterrupted research time. And it's been a really great luxury to have that while I've been here. So I'm, I'm really grateful to you for giving me the chance to do that. So on to the matter at hand, as Carolyn said. Uh, what I want to talk about today is U.S. foreign policy before 1914. Most of my research prior to this time about U.S. foreign policy has focused on the post-1945 period. But one of the questions that I've gotten interested in uh, in teaching classes and doing research on this topic was just how the United States came to acquire the world role that it's played since 1945. From this perspective, the period before uh, 1914 is actually an interesting one. During the 25 years before that time, the U.S. built a battleship fleet, like Carolyn said, acquired overseas colonies and started intervening militarily with much greater frequency, especially in Latin America, but also to a lesser extent in Asia as well. Yeah. At the same time, the salience of the United States in the world economy grew enormously. If you take a look at the graph I've got here, you can get a sense of the scale of U.S. economic growth during the 19th century, particularly the later part of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, the U.S. was probably the largest economy in the world by, by 1900. Uh, in fact, the trajectory of U.S. growth during this period looks a little bit like China today, who's another rising power. And I think some of the same dilemmas the United States faced would be faced by other rising powers, although in a very different historical context. People at the time and since have tended to treat the implications of this as sort of obvious. It's obvious that the U.S. was going to play a much more active role in world politics. I found a really interesting quote uh, addressing this issue in The Economist, the British news magazine, from November 11th of 1899. This was a part of their coverage of uh, U.S. debates over the treaty ending the Spanish-American War. Uh, they wrote this, the states have grown too great for a policy of isolation. We are all, in both countries, familiar with the records of men who, having risen to great rank, have resolved in their own minds to make no change, but to remain precisely as they were, and have found it a resolution impossible to keep. They are not the same men, but more free, more powerful, and more responsible, both to God and man. Above all, the world has changed its attitude toward them, regards them more keenly, is more deferential or hostile in its bearing, is more disposed to facilitate or prevent their action. Gradually, the risen man finds that he must change, accepts the situation, puts off the old simplicity, and tries to do his duty as millionaire, leading politician, or grandee. It will be so with America, whether her people like the change or not. Now, there's definitely something to this argument, because during this period, other states did react more to the United States. And with the U.S. economy as large as it became during this period, it would be difficult for them to not have, because economic processes and economic policies in the United States had big effects on other states during this time. However, things are also not quite as simple as this quote suggests. Even though it may be obvious that the U.S. was going to become more active, the content of that activism was not so obvious. In fact, uh, elsewhere in the uh, article that produced that quote, the author argues that it's inevitable that the U.S. is going to shed its commitment to protectionism. And that's something that didn't happen for a very long time after that quote was written. And what I want to argue to you today is that that has huge consequences for the shape of American activism during this period. And in fact, if you think about it, U.S. foreign policy in the 1890s to 1914 period is pursuing something that's almost diametrically opposed to what it was pursuing after 1945. You can argue that the U.S. was pursuing a kind of imperialist foreign policy or seeking an empire both before 1914 and also after 1945. But the kind of empire that it was seeking was very different during these two periods. 
So the research question that motivates this project is this. How did trade influence U.S. foreign policy between 1890 and 1914? There are two parts to this answer, one of which is really well known and the other of which is not. The well-known part of the answer is that there was an enormous demand in the United States for export markets. Influential Americans became convinced that this was vitally important for the future of the United States, and this had some foreign policy implications that I want to talk about. The neglected part of this answer is that the Republican Party remained deeply committed to a very high protective tariff in the United States during this period. This also had foreign policy implications that are in some ways just as important, but that haven't received nearly as much attention as uh, the export market side of the equation has. Um, the title of my talk comes from a 1901 comment by a British journalist named Sidney Brooks, who had spent several years in the United States, both right before and right after the Spanish-American War, addressing this very issue. And he said this, there is no political danger discoverable to Great Britain in American imperialism, but to British trade, American imperialism cannot be anything but a menace. The American empire is a protectionist empire. The open door in the Philippines was never anything but a myth in which only those who did not know America could believe. Uh, let me say one other thing before I move on to the main part of the talk. Uh, this is part of a larger project. Uh, I, I only want to focus on one part today, and that's uh, the foreign policy implications of trade protection and how they got played out in foreign policy debates at the time. But when I conclude the talk, I want to say a little more about where this fits into the other work I've been doing while I'm here at the library. So I want to start with two stylized facts about the role of trade in American politics. Uh, I'll just tell you what they are first, and then I'll discuss each one in somewhat more detail. Uh, on the export side, as I said, there's a growing concern about access to overseas markets and a belief that this was important for the future growth of the U.S. economy. On the import side, there was a huge partisan controversy over the protective tariff. And both of these have to be considered if you want to understand how trade influenced U.S. foreign policy. Let me turn first to the uh, export side of the equation. Previous research has uh, pretty well demonstrated that there were a lot of people worried about foreign markets uh, during the 1890 to 1914 period. I think it's the great contribution of the Wisconsin School of Historians to sort of document just how pervasive this concern was among American foreign policy elites. And they don't exaggerate. If you read uh, the literature on this, I've trying to, been trying to go through a lot of the articles people wrote at the time about US foreign policy. They bring up concerns about uh, commercial advantage and access to export markets all the time. It comes up uh, pretty constantly. It's actually more like now than it was like the, the Cold War in a lot of ways. The reason for a concern about this had to do with falling prices in the late 19th century. As you can see from the graph I've put up here with the uh, price series for several different types of commodities, uh, prices fell pretty steadily from 1873 on. And this led to a series of increasingly nasty economic crises within the United States. And you can see that the these price series bottom out uh, between 1893 and 1896, which was probably when the worst of these uh, economic crises took place. Now, the main diagnosis behind the reason for this by American foreign policy elites was that uh, there was what they called surplus production. That is, uh, as a byproduct of this rapid U.S. economic growth, more was being produced than could be consumed by the U.S. market at home at uh, rates of profit that were tolerable to producers of either agricultural or, or industrial commodities. So this, the solution they came up with was, well, we need to have access to foreign markets. Maybe these foreign markets can consume the surplus that can't be profitably sold at home. This was the argument of the Wisconsin School. I should point out that there were other people, when you read through the literature, like uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan and Brooks Adams, who were more concerned with the uh, sort of geopolitical side of access to foreign markets. They believed that controlling these markets was important for the future political power of the United States. But the bottom line for both groups was the same. The U.S. needs to have access to overseas markets if it's going to continue to be prosperous and powerful enough to ensure its independence and all those other good things. Now, access to foreign markets had major foreign policy implications during this period. I have a picture here of the USS Indiana, which is the first of the battleships that were built during this period. There were a number of others constructed in sort of fits and starts between 1890 and 1914. These are useful because threats to your access to foreign markets can come in a variety of forms, for some of which battleships are useful. There can be resistance or regulation by local authorities in the areas to which you would like to export 
your products. Most of the time, these are going to be dealt with by trade agreements, but in some cases, the battleships also can come in handy. Uh, secondly, there could be local civil conflicts or disorders that are beyond the control of the state in the area that you'd like to export uh, your goods to. Uh, and for, in these cases, some kind of intervention uh, was often uh, a solution to the problem that people found. And thirdly, there can be interference from third states with your access to overseas markets. This is not something we think much about now, but it was a major preoccupation for policymakers during this period. And the form this took was an expansion of European empires in less developed areas of the world. The concern of American policymakers was that once the Europeans have carved these areas up into their own exclusive zones of control, that Americans would not be allowed to trade or invest there. And this was another reason to uh, build these battleships so you can you know, challenge uh, Europeans if they try to prohibit you from having access to these areas you'd like to trade in. I should point out here that battleships alone are not enough. Uh, if you want to use these things for power projection, you need bases that are located in reasonable proximity to the places you'd like to project your power uh, for coaling stations and for repair and the like, and sometimes to protect those bases, it would be nice to control the, the hinterland around them, and next thing you know, you have a colony or something like that. So uh, a lot of foreign policy comes along with this. The, the battleships are just the, the tip of the iceberg. Now, there's another big stylized fact about the role of trade in American politics, and this is the one that gets most overlooked. And that is that there was a huge partisan controversy in the United States over the protective tariff. We never argue about tariffs much anymore. And it's kind of strange for uh, us to think about the tariff as being a big political issue and something in which people were emotionally invested. But indeed, that was the case in the late 19th century. Now, the US had, high t had, had high tariffs ever since the Civil War. They were initially probably a, a revenue-raising measure as much as anything to fight the Civil War. But they also had the effect of protecting domestic, especially manufacturers, from foreign competition. And this was one of the reasons that they were maintained. And after 1887, this became an increasingly serious partisan issue. And I want to explain to you why. Protection in the United States during this period was something that was mainly for manufacturers. Agriculture in the US was really export oriented in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, what I have here is a graph that shows you the share of US exports uh, that was accounted for by several big commodities. And the first thing you'll notice from this graph is that cotton accounts for something around 25% of US exports all throughout uh, the period that we're talking about here. Cotton is the largest US export commodity. Uh, tobacco and wheat, I, another sort of broad agricultural category, is also quite important. And bringing up the rear are the sort of category of automobiles, iron and steel, and machinery. Of course, automobiles are only uh, something that they're manufacturing for a short part of this time. But um, iron and steel and machinery was something that was built throughout. And at the time, the US went off on its career of acquiring colonies and building battleships and things like that. Agriculture were the main export items. What this meant was that the protective tariff was protecting mainly manufactured products. Agriculture in the US didn't need protection, and by and large, it didn't really receive it, not that it would, would have helped. I mean, there was really very little foreign competition for agriculture in the United States at the time. What this meant was that farmers had to pay a higher protected price for manufactured goods that they might want to purchase. And at the same time, they would just receive the world market price for what they produced. And this means that there's going to be a net transfer of wealth from the agricultural sector, where people are paying these somewhat artificially high prices, to the manufacturing sector in the US during this period. Um, one of the, an observer at the time writing the North American Review put it this way. Our farmer sells on the basis of Liverpool prices in the market of the world. He buys home productions at a protected price, and thus he is hit both ways. So this is bad for farmers, good for manufacturers. This has big regional implications in the United States as well, because manufacturing in the US is very heavily concentrated in the Northeast. To give you a sense of what this looks like, I have a, a map here that shows you value added from manufacturing per capita in US states in 1900, out of the 1900 census. What you can see here is that the states with the highest value are all located really in the Northeast. There's a couple of weird outliers, Montana and Arizona. It turns out that those come uh, entirely from uh, copper smelting and manufacturing, uh, well, copper smelting and refining. Uh, that sector accounts for 65% of manufacturing in Montana and 79% 
in Arizona. So those are deviant cases. The fundamental story here is that manufacturing is something that takes place almost entirely in the northeastern United States. The 15 states between New England and the Great Lakes held 77% of manufacturing employment and output during this period, and 79% of the capital invested. Um, there were other policies. So when we talk about uh, income being transferred from agriculture to manufacturing, we're also talking about income being transferred from the rest of the country to the northeastern United States. Uh, something that's not lost on political representatives at the time. Uh, to make the redistributive effect even sharper, a lot of the revenue that was generated by the tariff went to pay for pensions for union veterans and also for widows and orphans of, of union veterans, uh, most of whom obviously lived in, in the Northeast, and they certainly didn't live in, in the South, which is the most export-oriented uh, part of the country. As I said, the redistributive implications of the tariff were not lost on representatives of various regions of the United States. The Democratic Party has it, had its big stronghold at the time in the South, and the stronghold of the Republican Party was in the Northeast. You can kind of see here why they would fight over the tariff, given the effects that it's having on their constituency. Uh, the man on the left, George Vest, had this to say about the tariff. The existing tariff is an obstruction to healthy and legitimate commerce. It narrows and restricts the markets for American products, and especially those of agriculture. It is based upon the idea that the American farmer must look to the home market alone, and if that does not give remunerative prices for his surplus, the loss must be borne patiently and patriotically for the general welfare, he said sarcastically. Their alternative was to rely less on the tariff, reduce it substantially, and use an income tax instead to raise revenue. Uh, the man on the right, Roger Mills, who's actually probably the most important of the Democratic advocates of uh, lower tariffs, uh, said this about the income tax. We produce over eight billions of manufactured products protected against competition. It would not be unjust to call upon it for a contribution. Unfortunately for these guys, uh, the protectionists were at uh, a, a, had a real political edge all throughout this period because the U.S. population was also concentrated in the northeastern states, much as manufacturing was. This is obviously uh, no coincidence. Uh, I have a map here of the Electoral College from uh, 1900. Uh, in 1900, there were a total of 447 electoral votes. So that means you need 224 electoral votes to win the White House, the numbers in each state or how many electoral votes they have. If all you did was to win the shaded area, which is the heavily manufacturing region of the United States, you would have 214 of the 224 electoral votes you needed to win the election. So if you're running on a high tariff platform, these are the people who benefit the most. All you have to do is reach out and grab 10 extra electoral votes. Uh, protectionists tended to do that by placing some uh, import competing agricultural products on the tariff list, including things like wool and sugar, and that could might be enough to, to win the presidency for you. This also reflects the balance in Congress, too, because you know, each electoral vote uh, is basically one seat in, in Congress. So Congress also heavily represents the Northeast. Actually, if you just win four states, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, that gives you 106 electoral votes, which is like halfway to victory in the presidential election. What this meant was that Democrats had an uphill battle to win the presidency all throughout this period, and things did not go well. No incumbent Democrat was reelected between the Civil War and uh, 1916. Uh, they always lost. So no one was in the White House for longer than four years. One Democrat, of course, was reelected, but he lost first and then was reelected after a four year uh, interval. So fundamentally, when we're talking about US foreign policy during this period, we're talking about a foreign policy that's shaped by Republicans and by protectionist Republicans. They controlled the White House for 19 of the 25 years, between 1890 and 1914, and they control it continuously from uh, the election of 1896 until Woodrow Wilson is elected in 1912, which is really when the foreign policy actually emerges. So when we're talking about the policy, we're talking about something that they get to determine. So what were the foreign policy implications of protectionism anyway? I've rambled on about this, and I haven't even told you what they are yet. Well, I'm going to do that now. Uh, the first important implication is it led to a focus on markets in less developed areas of the world rather than in developed countries. If you read the literature of the time or the historiography that's been written about it, uh, the discussion of foreign markets is all about China and Latin America. Actually, this is pretty odd if you look at the trade statistics at the time. 
uh, Europe was actually the best market for American exports, and not just for American agricultural exports, but for darn near everything the U.S. was exporting. And the reason for this is not really hard to understand. The less developed areas of the world were obviously much, much poorer than Europe was during this period, so they didn't have the capacity to buy lots of American exports. Uh, Europe did, and that was the best market uh, for these products. Now, opponents of the tariff were quick to point out that the tariff, quote, exercises the severest pressures against those countries that have become our best customers, because tariffs all on manufacturers, and that's a large part of what Europe wants to export to the United States. Moreover, let these less developed markets that they're so interested in are the ones that require the kind of costly foreign policy action that uh, you, know, you might not necessarily want to undertake. You don't have to build battleships or acquire colonies to trade with, say, Britain. You might have to do that to trade with China. Uh, but Britain's a much better market. So the question you have to ask yourself is why would you be so interested in these very poor and rather unpromising markets in areas of the world that are subject to political upheavals that require you to build a big military force in order to maintain access? The reason is that developed countries tended to retaliate against high American tariffs on manufacturers. Uh, I was surprised to learn that the term dumping, which we use today to describe a situation in which you sell in a foreign market at below what it cost you to produce something, was also used back then to describe the same practice. The high U.S. tariff was in place precisely so that American manufacturers could charge a price above the world market price for what they produced. But this was you know, incredibly politically provocative to other states that wanted to export manufacturers to the United States because it's forcing them to compete at a very severe disadvantage, indeed maybe a prohibitive disadvantage in, in a lot of cases. So whenever there was an increase in the U.S. tariff, there was predictable response from uh, European uh, uh, leaders that you know, this is unacceptable. And there were a whole lot of schemes they came up with to retaliate against the United States and sort of try to exclude the U.S. from their market in retaliation. Uh, interestingly, this didn't provoke uh, any kind of conciliatory response from the United States. Here's an excerpt from a 1903 editorial about uh, a possible British plan for an imperial um, preference system that would discriminate against U.S. exports to Britain. All this country needs to do is to keep on the way it has been going, build up its industries by protection, seek markets in South America, China, and other such countries, and nothing that European nations can do in the way of tariff barriers will check or stop our growth. Less developed country markets are more attractive because they won't be exporting manufacturers to the United States. So they don't really have a lot of reason to complain about very high U.S. tariffs on manufactured products because it's just not uh, a concern of theirs. Protectionists noted this, and they tended to argue that these are the best markets for the future of the United States for that reason, because they envisioned uh, you know, protection for, for the long term. I'll give you an example uh, from an argument made by, by this man, Whitelaw Reed. He's not exactly a, a household word now, but he was a very important Republican politician in the late 19th century. He actually ran unsuccessfully for vice president in 1892 when the Republicans lost to Grover Cleveland. But he was also appointed to be part of the commission that negotiated the peace treaty that ended the war with Spain and that acquired the Philippines for the United States. And he made a speaking tour around the United States in which he tried to argue that acquiring the Philippines was a good idea, was going to be something that would be helpful for the United States in the long run. And he laid a very heavy emphasis on the access it would give the United States to markets in Asia. And he said this, that way lies now the best hope of American commerce. There you may command a natural rather than an artificial trade, a trade which pushes itself instead of needing to be pushed, a trade with people who can send you things you want and cannot produce, and take from you in return things they want and cannot produce. In other words, a trade largely between different zones, largely with less advanced peoples, comprising one-fourth of the population of the globe, whose wants promise to be speedily and enormously developed. The Atlantic Ocean carries mainly a different trade, with people as advanced as ourselves, who could produce or procure elsewhere much of what they buy from us, while we could produce, if driven to it, most of what we buy from them. It is more or less, therefore, an artificial trade, as well as a trade in which we have lost the first place and will find it difficult to regain. So it's less developed markets that they see as the most promising areas. A second implication is that the United States ended up pursuing exclusive bilateral arrangements or unilateral privileges for governing its trade with other states. Until 1901, the main plan for gaining access to foreign markets were bilateral reciprocity agreements with other states in which they would reduce their tariffs uh, on U.S. exports in exchange for U.S. reductions on tariffs uh, for their exports. 
Now, it's important to keep in mind that uh, these things were actually not steps toward free trade. This is puzzling in some ways because since 1945, this is how uh, the international trading system has been governed. But the way it's worked since then is that other states who have most favored nation status will also gain the benefit of a tariff reduction you give to anyone else. Because what most favored nation status is supposed to do is to grant to the states who hold it the lowest tariff that anyone receives on whatever it is that they want to export to the United States. Before 1923, however, the U.S. Uh, offered up a special and unique interpretation of most favored nation status that didn't allow this to happen. This was known as the American interpretation of uh, most favored nation status because the U.S. was really the only country that offered it. What this interpretation said was that states are only entitled to this sort of generalized tariff reductions under most favored nation status if those tariff reductions were extended uh, generally, and not if they were offered up for some special favor that another state gave in return. If another state got a tariff reduction because they granted the U.S. a special favor, then the most favored nations don't get that tariff reduction. As you can well imagine, this interpretation was deeply unpopular with uh, U.S. trading partners who didn't uh, receive the benefits of it. But there was a good reason why protectionist policymakers needed to keep things this way. And that is that if you allow there to be unconditional most favored nation status and everybody gets the benefit of these tariff reductions, then all these individual reciprocity agreements you negotiate are going to have the effect of reducing your tariff overall. And that was something they wanted to avoid. Uh, without unconditional most favored nation status, you can sort of pick and choose the states you want to trade with and uh, just have a special deal with them and it doesn't have to be generalized to other states. Moreover, the United States also put a lot of pressure on the trading partners with whom it negotiated these agreements not to generalize the benefits they gave to the United States or the, the tariff concessions they gave to the United States to their other trading partners so that this would be sort of an exclusive privilege granted to U.S. exporters. Now, this was a really hard deal to get other states to accept, as you can well imagine, because they, they don't get anything out of it. All it does is to uh, provide a rent uh, that is an above normal profit to the U.S. exporter. But they still tried to, uh, you know, get, it, get people to accept it and, and hardly anyone would. But before 1923, that was how things worked. Now, American manufacturers were strongly opposed to any kind of uh, reduction in the tariff on manufactured products that were produced within the United States. A cartoon here from uh, November of 1901. There were two parts to the Dingley Tariff. One was a provision for lots of trade protection, and the other was a provision for these reciprocity agreements with other states. Something happened in November of 1901 that suggested to this cartoonist and really to anyone with half a brain that the protection side of this was a little bit more robust than the reciprocity side. The McKinley administration had negotiated a series of reciprocity agreements with a number of states, including several European states. The most controversial one was one with France because it provided for tariff reductions um, to be extended to French exporters on a bunch of manufactured products in exchange for reductions on French tariffs on U.S. manufacturers. And this provoked a lot of controversy among American manufacturers. In November of 1901, the National Association of Manufacturers called what they referred to as a National Reciprocity Convention here in Washington, D.C. And representatives of all different industries came and met under the auspices of the National Association of Manufacturers. And they debated whether these reciprocity agreements were really a good idea. You can actually read a transcript of their debate, and it makes for pretty fascinating reading. There were some people who wanted to have these agreements, but the overprevailing sentiment was that these were really not a good idea. In the end, the convention endorses reciprocity, quote, only where it can be done without injury to any of our home interests of manufacturing, commerce, or farming. Uh, and in the end, the treaties were not ratified. None of them were. And the administration sort of stopped, uh, the, the Roosevelt administration, Theodore Roosevelt, that is, backed off from negotiating any further reciprocity agreements. They did a few, but not very many. And the reason was that politically, they were just a very tough sell, uh, particularly to a Republican constituency. Fortunately for protectionists, uh, the reciprocity agreements were not the only weapon in their arsenal for negotiating access to foreign markets. Another was uh, colonial tariffs, and the U.S. had acquired colonies after the Spanish-American War. The nice thing about colonies is that you get to decide what their tariffs are going to be because you hold sovereignty over them. Uh, well, it's nice for you, maybe not, not so nice for, for the colonies, but still. Uh, the U.S. had promised not to discriminate in favor of non-U.S. exporters to the Philippines for at least 10 years after 1899. This was part 
of the peace treaty with Spain. Initially, it was just going to be we won't discriminate against Spanish exports, but then the U.S. generalized it to everyone. So there was, in effect, an open-door policy in the Philippines. This is what uh, uh, the quote I started out with was, was ridiculing, that only those who don't know America could believe that this was real. And sure enough, after 10 years, they revoked it and uh, had a special Philippine tariff that uh, allowed U.S. goods in duty-free and charged a really high tariff on everybody else. In the meantime, however, American exporters also lobbied for specific changes in the tariff that would benefit them individually. So these were not going to be changes that would discriminate explicitly against other states, but the things that U.S., the United States tended to export to the Philippines would face a lower export than the things that other states tended to export to the Philippines. Uh, there was a large body of correspondence on this issue that was published by the Senate in 1902, and it provides an interesting window into exactly how all this tariff lobbying took place. But the bottom line is that they found ways to discriminate in favor of U.S. products, even when they weren't explicitly doing it. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the colonies were not major markets at any point during this period, and we're talking about the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam, so these are not huge markets. However, it was by no means obvious in 1900 or 1901 that the United States wasn't going to acquire any more colonies. In fact, there was a lot of speculation about other parts of Latin America that might ultimately be colonized by the United States, or if not colonized, then at least some kind of agreement would be negotiated that would make them into protectorates of one sort or another. So this was actually something that people argued about. What about other forms of political pressure for unilateral uh, concessions? Um, apparently, the Roosevelt administration relied increasingly heavily on informal diplomatic efforts to get other states to grant the U.S. special tariff reductions after the fa failure of those reciprocity treaties in, in 1901. Now, I need to read a lot more in the consular reports of the time to know exactly what it was that they were asking for and how much success they enjoyed. They did report all of this back. It's just that I haven't been able to go through all that stuff just yet. In the meantime, it's possible to test statistically whether U.S. influence had an effect on the volume of American exports to areas where uh, there was some kind of special American political influence. Now, we know that U.S. diplomats and consuls in the Caribbean basin had a lot more means of influence at their disposal than U.S. consuls and representatives elsewhere in the world. The threat of U.S. intervention was a lot greater in the Caribbean basin than it was anywhere else. The U.S. intervened in a lot of these countries relatively frequently and sometimes occupied them for real, pretty lengthy periods of time. Moreover, the United States controlled customs houses in a number of Caribbean countries, either by force or through some kind of quasi-voluntary agreement. And wh what better way to control their tariffs than by controlling their custom houses where the tariffs are charged? Now, if U.S. political influence really did help to open export markets, then it should be the case that U.S. exports to these Caribbean states would grow more rapidly than U.S. exports to other parts of the world or at other periods of history. You can get a rough sense of this by looking at this graph. I've rendered the volume of exports here as an index where 1870 is equal to one. So for each year, the volume of U.S. exports is as a multiple of what they were in 1870. So you can see that they go up kind of across the board over time. This is part of the general uh, increase in the economic salience of the United States due to its economic growth. But there are a couple things in this graph that suggest that there was something unusual going on in the Caribbean during this period. First off, there was really no difference between the Caribbean and other states before 1898. If you take a look at the graph, you can see that there are periods when the yellow line is a little below the other lines and periods where it's a little bit above it up until 1898. And then there's a big jump after that, where suddenly the yellow line is the highest one. Those are exports from the United States to independent countries in the Caribbean basin. And after 1903, when Theodore Roosevelt announced his Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine that sort of adopted a much more interventionist posture by the United States, those exports go way up. And they do increase a, a lot more rapidly than they do to other areas of the world. Now, it's possible to do a more formal statistical test of this using data on U.S. exports to the individual countries and colonies that comprised each of these regions. And what you find when you do that is that the annual increase in American exports to Caribbean states was roughly $410,000 a year on average, greater than it was to other less developed areas of the world. One modification to what you see in this graph is that it turns out that the rate of increase in U.S. exports to the Caribbean wasn't any higher than the rate of increase in U.S. exports to Europe, on the other hand. So Europe still 
a pretty good market and growing just as rapidly as the area in which the U.S. is exercising the most political pressure. I think the reason for this political pressure rests with the concerns of protectionists, not the quality of that area as a market. Uh, the third and final foreign policy implication of protectionism I want to talk about has to do with the tone of U.S. foreign policy. I put a question mark here because this is the one where I'm walking furthest out onto a limb. Uh, the exclusive arrangements and the focus on less developed markets are immediate implications of protectionism. Those, they just go right along with it. This one is a sort of less direct one, but I think you can still make a case that it's there. The foreign policy I've talked about so far is, is pretty uncooperative in, in many respects. And these uncooperative economic premises lead to an opportunistic and unilateralist U.S. foreign policy overall. One prominent tariff reformer in the United States put it this way, restrictions on the commercial intercourse of nations differ in form only from acts of war, and such acts inevitably tend to develop ill feeling and prompt acts of retaliation. Recent research has found some empirical support for the claim that protectionist states tend to behave a little more aggressively than states that are less protectionist. The controversy over the Monroe Doctrine illustrates the linkage between trade protection and aggressive foreign policy overall pretty clearly. I have a, a cartoon here from the time of the Venezuelan boundary dispute. There was a dispute between uh, British Guiana and uh, Venezuela over the border between the two countries on, around the Orinoco River. This was not a particularly important dispute from the United States' point of view because, I mean, there weren't any immediate material stakes for the U.S. Uh, however, the government of Venezuela hired a really good publicist in 1894 who brought this to the attention of uh, American foreign policy elites, and it began to be debated in Congress and in the, the, the literature. And the argument here is, well, if we let the British get away with enforcing a territorial claim against Venezuela, that will violate the Monroe Doctrine's prohibition on acquisition of further territory by European powers. And that's sort of the thrust of this cartoon. I like this cartoon for two reasons. One is that it features the least threatening rendering of the British lion probably ever in the history of print. You can see it looks like kind of a, a stuffed animal down there. Uh, and the other is that if you look back behind the Monroe Doctrine stick, you'll see that there's two other masked figures. Now, you can't read the words on them because I couldn't get the print to render clearly enough for that, but they say uh, Germany and France. The stake in the crisis here wasn't just about Britain, it's about whether other states might be emboldened if the British are allowed to get away with this, this terrible uh, land grab against the poor Venezuelan bakery in this case. So if you think about this from the perspective of protectionists, the, the costs that you might incur from a conflict with Britain are relatively lower than the cost would be for free traders. Uh, sure, you'll disrupt trade with the British, but they're already disrupting that anyway by having incredibly high tariffs on British exports to the United States. At the same time, the thing they're seeking to protect, U.S. sort of control, uh, political control over Latin America, was something that was very important to them because this represented the future export market that they had in mind for the United States. From a free trade perspective, on the other hand, this policy just looks crazy. We're talking about threatening war with our largest trading partner, uh, over a dispute in which we have no immediate stake, where we might be preserving access to markets that are extremely poor and unpromising. And if you look at the political debates over this, people line up in pretty much that way. I'll give you some examples uh, from a couple of these guys. Uh, the person on the left is Edward Atkinson. He's not exactly a household name or anything like that, but uh, he was one of the later founders of the Anti-Imperialist League in the United States. And he was a big advocate of free trade. He published pamphlets and articles uh, arguing that the U.S. should lower its tariffs. And the guy on the right is kind of a household name. That's Henry Cabot Lodge, a Republican senator from Massachusetts. Uh, Lodge took a really hard-line position over the Venezuela boundary dispute. He argued that the U.S. had a, quote, rightful supremacy in Latin America. And he said this, the supremacy of the Monroe Doctrine should be established and at once, peaceably if we can, forcibly if we must. More interestingly, for my purposes, he also singled out free traders as opponents of the national interest. I'll just read you a little bit of what he said. Despite the efforts of Cobden and his followers, England has gone on in her career of territorial expansion, accompanied by a good deal of fighting and sustained by an army and navy. But our free traders, not content with urging their economic views, have undertaken at the same time to break down the American spirit and to prevent our defending our own interests in other parts of the world. 
Take up any of the few newspapers consecrated to tariff reform or free trade. Look at the speeches of their orators or the writings of those of them they always refer to as thinkers or publicists, and you will find everywhere the same note. Everywhere there is opposition and abuse for the Navy and sneers at any attempt to uphold the rights of the United States against another nation. By these people, America and Americanism are put in quotation marks and treated as opprobrious and dishonoring epithets, and patriotism is held up as vulgar and something to which no well-bred person should prefer. He goes on in that vein for like another page and a half, and then he concludes with this. We have had something too much of these disciples of the Manchester School who think the price of calico more important than a nation's honor, the duties on pig iron more important than the advance of the race. Now, predictably, comments like this angered Atkinson and others who were advocates of free trade. I mean, after all, their patriotism is being impugned. It's, it's pretty vicious. Uh, Atkinson wrote a series of articles to rebut what Lodge had said. Yeah, and I'll read you a little bit of that, too. We have lately been told by the jingoists who, under the cant of patriotism, promote aggressive violence in our relations with other countries, that the honor of this nation must not be weighed against mere dollars and cents. That may be admitted. But when it is proposed to dishonor the country by an aggressive and violent jingo policy without warrant of any kind, it becomes fit to count the cost of possible war in dollars and cents in order to bring the malignant influence of the jingo faction into most conspicuous notice. He then pointed out that U.S. trade with Britain actually exceeded the combined value of U.S. trade with Latin America and China combined, which was a, sort of a true fact from the export statistics of the time. And he said this, the prosperity of the grain grower of the West, of the dairyman of the Middle States, and of the cotton grower of the South demands alike that every effort shall be asserted to overcome the prejudice and animosity which find their expression in jingoism. I don't think it's any um, coincidence that he omitted from his list of people whose welfare depended on this, the, the manufacturer of the Northeastern states, because that would probably not have been a true statement. He also linked jingoism directly to the advocacy of trade protection in much the same way that Lodge had linked the advocacy of free trade to uh, a sort of weakness in foreign policy. It is perfectly logical for the advocates of a prohibitory tariff to take the position long since taken by Henry C. Carey, who said that he would regard a 10 years war with England as the greatest material benefit that could happen to this country. People are wiser now than they were when they listened to such a false prophet, and yet today there are a sufficient number of ignorant persons to whom such a similar appeal can be made. If you set aside their harsh rhetoric toward one another, and it's kind of, I enjoyed their harsh rhetoric, so I'm reluctant to do that, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can see that they're both actually making kind of a similar point. It turns out that an interest in free trade with developed states really does imply a more conciliatory foreign policy toward them. And once you're no longer convinced that you must impose high tariffs on their exports to you, then a number of avenues for cooperation open up that are just not there if you believe that this trade protection really is necessary. At the same time, if you believe that uh, trade protection is very necessary and important, you're Henry Cabot Lodge, he's not wrong to point out that coercion is probably going to be a big part of the foreign policy that promotes that, because ultimately the arrangements you need to set up with other states to gain access to overseas markets while prohibitively protecting your own are going to come down to coercion at some point or other, and I think Lodge uh, understood that. So let me offer you a few concluding thoughts and then I'll invite your questions. I've already droned on way longer than I probably should have. First off, is there continuity in American foreign policy activism? I think the answer is no. Think first about the influence of trade protection on the foreign policy that Republicans were proposing. It affected their regional priorities, it influenced the kinds of international cooperation they could realistically consider, and it affected the general tone of their foreign policy overall. This foreign policy is starkly different from the one the United States pursued after World War II. After World War II, the U.S. sought to set up a system that would promote free trade through multilateral institutions, and this was something that uh, Republican protectionists before 1914, and indeed long after 1914, were staunchly opposed to. It ran 180 degrees the opposite of the direction that they wanted to go in. Support for American activism after 1945 is strongly associated with having an interest in free trade and supporting free trade. Before 1914, the opposite is true. If you're a protectionist, you're more likely to support foreign policy activism before World War I. 
The logical sequel of foreign policy activism by the United States before World War I is not the foreign policy activism of the post-1945 period, it's the isolationism of the interwar years. And I think if you look at who those people were and the positions they ended up taking after 1914, you'll find out that that's uh, where a lot of them went. The bottom line here is that there really is no continuity between this pre-1914 activism and what comes after 1945. I think we should all be wary of suggestions that this early period of US imperialism is somehow the precursor of what comes later. Because while there is a superficial resemblance between you know, the urge to build battleships back then and you know, the big military spending that comes after 1945, the resemblance is, is pretty superficial. These things are being used to promote very different uh, foreign policies. And again, you can argue that they're both imperialist foreign policies of a kind, but they're really different imperialist foreign policies. And let me just conclude by offering a, a couple of thoughts about the other parts of this project and how these things would, would fit in with it. Uh, everything I've presented to you up to now is about the public debate. Uh, it's not really about arguments that are proposed by policymakers within the state at all. I have reasons for doing it that way, and I'd be happy to talk about those if anyone's interested. But I would like to look in the future at policy planning within the state, particularly uh, within the military apparatus, because they were actually large enough to have the capacity to do some policy planning. And it stands to reason that they may have been less obsessed with commercial advantage than a lot of the civilian thinkers that I've looked at so far. I'd also like to assess the extent of the association between trade protection and support for pre-1914 activism. Uh, in order to do this, I'm gonna need some data on the trade interests of each of the US states and of the voting record of the people who represented them. This is something that I'm, I'm gathering and putting together, but it takes a long time and I'm, I'm not finished with it yet. Uh, what I'm really interested in is whether export-oriented manufacturers started to split away from the more protectionist-oriented manufacturers that really dominated the whole manufacturing sector before 1914, sometime before World War I. We know that there was a split after World War I, but I'm curious about whether this extends to any time before that, that period. And lastly, I need to look at the role of the gold standard in all of this. The gold standard created winners and losers in the United States in a lot of the same ways that protection did. And one of the things I'm still a little unclear on is whether those winners and losers were the same as those created by trade or whether they differed in some ways. But this is definitely an issue that deserves scrutiny and I haven't uh, had time to give it to it yet. So I will stop there and invite your questions. Yes. I think they're going to bring a microphone over to you. Uh, James Blaine, when he was the second stint as Secretary of State under Harrison, he really began to push reciprocity and wrote a lot about the fact that the U.S. had matured to a point where it could, you know, use the tariff as a battering ram. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it didn't work out that way, as you argue. The Republicans stayed very much protectionists. And you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it is true that reciprocity was largely Blaine's idea, and it was introduced as part of the 1890 McKinley tariff. Uh, then the, the Democrats stripped it out when they got control in 1894, and it was put back in uh, under the, the Dingley tariff. In principle, uh, reciprocity was something that, that could have worked. It was a reasonable policy option for a big protectionist like Blaine, and he was a big advocate of, of high tariffs, wrote quite a lot about it. Uh, Blaine's idea was that reciprocity would take place almost exclusively with less developed markets, especially South America. That was his big target. And the idea there was that it wouldn't provoke outrage from American manufacturers because you would just give them a tariff break on the non-manufactured or agricultural or other raw material exports that they were sending to the United States. And in exchange, they would lower their tariffs on U.S. manufacturers. This was the plan for tariff reform. And during that 1901 reciprocity convention that the National Association of Manufacturers sponsored, uh, they really harped on the fact that uh, the McKinley administration had deviated from that plan in negotiating a reciprocity agreement with France that required tariff reductions on manufactured products. So, but by that time, Blaine had died, so he wasn't around to, uh, to object to this. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
semester of Progressive Era or Gilded Age course, and um, it's fun to remind students that Southerners and rural Westerners actually wanted an income tax at some point. So thank you for, yeah. for that. <laughs> um, but that said, I was a little bit surprised, you know, coming from from a di different discipline and, and not at all being a quantitative historian, to see uh, you talk about sort of protectionist interests from the West and the South, but outside of the context of populism itself and the much larger money politics that animated populism, but how that, I mean, they're not just Democrats. You know, it's not just Democrats who are, care about the tariff, and also the way in which that region becomes a really vocal anti-imperialist block, not just the Atkinson and the, the Boston Brahmin parts. And so it seems like that would be something to kind of flesh out some of these other implications for foreign policy, not just the activism of the state, but also the, the anti-imperialist implications. And a little bit related to that was um, to suggest a different metric for measuring the U.S. in the Caribbean, because you talked about sort of U.S. exports to the Caribbean, but what increases at this time are Caribbean exports to the United States. And that really seems to be more the measure of U.S. influence or control in, in the region itself, that these areas, and I guess one of the, um, I'm starting to babble, but I'll stop it at this, that sort of one of the, I don't know, the, the cold, cruel ironies of U.S. foreign policy is that sort of the U.S. economy is much more important to these regions than any one of these regions are to the U.S. Um, mm. Something to consider. Yeah. Well, just to start with your sort of second comment first, uh, you're, you're quite right that the U.S., trade with the U.S. is more important to them than trade with them is to the U.S. This is a big source of leverage for the United States. I didn't mean to suggest that all the U.S. political leverage that would lead them to give sort of special trade advantages to the United States came from battleships or anything like that. In fact, I, I don't think that was the most important thing at all. I think it was, it was mostly about economic access to the U.S. market for things like sugar and coffee and stuff like that. Um, I think it's interesting looking at, to go back to your, your first question, which was about, uh, I guess, su political support for the t tariff in the United States, and it wasn't just Democrats. Uh, it, actually, if you look at congressional voting, on, I know there were people who supported uh, lower tariffs, who were sort of free traders, who were not Democrats. There were some Republicans who were like that. And there were plenty of Republicans who were willing to sort of privately entertain the idea that lower tariffs might be a, a good plan. But in point of fact, when it came to congressional voting, something like 99% of Republicans would vote in favor of a higher tariff bill, and like 99% of Democrats would vote against it. So it was a pretty partisan issue in a lot of ways. No, mm -hmm. no, sorry, that wasn't so much the question as okay, um, all right. that populists mm -hmm. are not, not that populists are also Republicans, but that not all Democrats are populists and sort of this conflation of, of mm -hmm. the Democratic Party at this time with more populist politics when I think the, the question is how sort of the Democrats kind of co-opt a populist protectionist agenda seems to be uh, missing a little bit. Yeah. Because also there's a very quick shift. I don't know if this is maybe part of your sec the second half of what you're going to research, mm -hmm. but say like the beet sugar manufacturers mm -hmm. out west who very quickly with the annexation of the Philippines become protectionists. Yeah. And, and so that might just. Yeah, well, th there were some agricultural interests, and sugar's the, the leading exemplar of this, also wool producers, who were quite protectionist. Uh, and I think that was probably part of an effort by this sort of protectionist coalition to reach out to some segments of agriculture that were uh, import competing and sort of bring them into the fold as well, because they did have to win a few states uh, from outside the Northeast. Uh, it's also true that I haven't really thought that much about how this relates to populism. And I think populism is driven heavily, at least in what I've read so far, which admittedly isn't very much, by concern about the gold standard more than the tariff. Uh, is that not the case? Or uh, co-opted? Co-opted. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
well, this is something I need to look more at. I mean, one of the, the distortions that gets introduced into what I'm looking at by the fact that all I've done so far is to read the foreign policy debates is that I tend to focus when I look for defenders of free trade on people like Edward Atkinson, who's more likely to write an article about this, than on the sources of support for free trade in Congress, which came heavily from the South and the West, and not from Boston, which was where Atkinson was from. In fact, Lodge is a much more typical example of how uh, people from Boston looked at things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ben, thanks for the talk. I thought it was great because it brings in an institutional aspect, which I think is very important. Uh, the sectoral interests of people within the uh, American economy. Uh, but what I saw at the last, I mean, we have been that had been touched in other questions as well was indeed the question of the gold standard, or better, the question of monetary standards uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. um, there are, of course, many ways to, let's say, protect your trade. Uh, one of them would be protective tariffs, that's one. But what I was wondering before I heard your talk was why, for instance, not take the devaluationist path? That would be another. You could devalue your currency, uh, or better, in, the, in this same period, um, just simply go choose for silver because the price of silver was actually just you know falling through the whole period uh, and apparently this was not done uh, at least not by the Republicans they chose for tariffs and now I because of your talk now I found out why um, it is of course because tariffs can be selective whereas when you devalue your currency is is universal that's going to apply to all products hmm? And I think it's a very, very important aspect uh, in your, uh, in, in, when, when writing the paper indeed. Um, the implications also stretch to the last question, whether there is, I believe now, uh, whether there is continuity in US foreign policy between and after 1914. The answer, I am afraid, is a bit more complicated than you suggest. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and the complication is, of course, with who sets the monetary standard. Before 1914, uh, the United States is pretty much absent from the international monetary conferences. Uh, apparently, they don't want to have to do with that for reasons I'd, I've never looked into. But in any, I mean, in any case, they, they don't want to have to do with that. After 1945, that obviously changes, because then the United States is setting the international monetary standard. It is the dollar standard. Mm -hmm. So the question of whether there is continuity pre-1914 and after 1945 is a bit misleading, as it assumes a state in which all other variables are kept constant, whereas actually it's not. because. 1945 actually simply means, you know, the arrival of the United States as the monetary standard setting country in the world. So its, it's situation has totally changed. Um, maybe can I have your thoughts on this? Uh, also with respect to the possibility of devaluing silver, uh, of, of devaluing the currency or going on a silver standard uh, in the period. Yeah, one of the reasons I haven't said more about the gold standard thus far is my, my initial thought was that the gold standard story would be a pretty straightforward one and that it would parallel what was going on in trade because a devaluation of the currency like the one that would be associated with uh, the you know, going off the gold standard and monetizing silver would have similar interest to, to uh, you know, trade protection. But it turns out that, that the political forces don't appear to line up that way. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure why. This is something I need to do a bit more research on. I mean, right now, it just doesn't make any sense to me uh, whatsoever. I'm not sure this is a very scholarly question, but I was just curious. If I recall correctly, the Panama Canal was open during this period. Uh, is there any evidence that had an impact on our trade policies? 
Well, I think actually building the Panama Canal was another sort of adjunct of protection because the effect it was expected to have would be to increase U.S. trade with Latin America and Asia because most U.S. exports are going to come from the northeastern United States, and this is going to allow them to pass through Panama Canal and then go down the west coast of South America or to Asia. So that was the effect they expected it to have. Uh, there was an expectation all throughout this period that a canal was going to be built, and even really before 1890 they were concerned about that. Uh, it did actually, I guess they started building it in, what, 1903 or 1904. It was completed in, I think, 1914. So it is built around the same time. The building of the canal and provisions for the security of the canal, I would argue, are part of the same set of foreign policies that go along with trade protection in, in general uh, during this period. If the U.S. had only been interested in, in overseas markets without this sort of burden of trade protection that they were carrying around, then they wouldn't have thought the canal was such a big deal. Because the canal isn't going to improve the access for most American exporters to, to Europe. It's only going to improve access to Asia and Latin America. So I'd argue that that's how it, it links up. Yes. I have uh, two questions. Um, one, I'm curious if you're seeing a distinction between um, foreign um, foreign states as consumers of, of U.S. goods, or is, uh, foreign citizens as consumers of U.S. goods? Are you know is a debate? You know, we want we want Haiti to buy our products. We want you know um, Venezuela to buy our products, or is it you know the Haitian people need to have cheap uh, sewing machines or what have you that are produced in um, the U.S. Um, the second question is, um, am I, it's my impression, although I may have the chronology wrong, that this is a period when the State Department is starting to develop a kind of, uh, you know, commercial, commercial staff that's, you know, looking into these issues. And I'm just curious if you know anything about um, competition within the State Department between, you know, the bureaucrats for, for Europe saying this is what we should do versus the Europe, the you know, the Latin America desk bureaucrat saying this is what our trade policy should be. Okay. Uh, thanks. Those are, those are good questions. Uh, there, first, there's this issue of are we trying to sell the foreign states or foreign consumers? And the short answer is that they're, they're trying to sell the foreign consumers. It's not the Haitian state that's going to purchase the U.S. exports. It's the consumers. However, in order for that to happen, you need for the, the state in these countries to either reduce its tariff barriers uh, to U.S. exports or, or maybe to take other kinds of actions that will facilitate the trade and make it possible. So there are things that the U.S. wants these other states to do, but those are in service of their desire that consumers in those countries buy American products. Uh, thinking about staffing within the State Department, uh, one of the things that struck me about this, and I didn't get a chance to talk much about this during the talk at all, one of the things that struck me most about this period is just the stark difference in the size of the U.S. state, including the State Department, during this period compared to what it was after World War II, which is the time when I've been used to studying it. In 1890, I think there were like 76 people working in Washington for the State Department. 76 people, that's the total. After World War II, it's something like 8,000. So their capacity for policy planning was greatly reduced by having essentially no one working there. Uh, and I think that I haven't had a chance to go through the State Department's records yet uh, in the archives. That's something I'm going to hopefully do in the next couple of months. But I'm, I'm actually not terribly optimistic that you're going to find a lot of the competition between different parts of the State Department over what to do that you really would find if you were looking at the post-45 period, simply because these organizations are so incredibly small. And what you see in the published records of uh, the State Department, you know, the, the Foreign Relations of the United States series or something like that, is very little long-term policy planning at all. And I, I, I have a suspicion that it just wasn't taking place during this period. After 1945, you definitely find exactly the kind of bureaucratic competition that you're talking about. But before then, it, you know, with this few people in place, it just, I don't think it happens. So, yes, in the front row. As you pointed out, the U.S. economy grew very rapidly in this period, and the manufacturing sector grew, and um, a fair number of companies became world class, a fair number of American manufacturing sectors became world class. Uh, was the state of the economy such that most of, all, most of the industrial consumption was still consumed in, inside the United States? How many of, how much of steel, railroad industries uh, exported and how much were, were they able to fulfill all their, sell all their products in-house in, in this mm -hmm. period? 
U.S. manufacturing was not particularly export-oriented during this period, nothing like it became later. I showed that graph earlier uh, indicating how much larger cotton was as a share of U.S. exports than any kind of manufactured product at all. Uh, so, and part of the reason that manufacturing, in fact, the reason that U.S. manufacturing was so much in favor of a protective tariff was that they were much more focused on the domestic market. Their top priority was maintaining exclusive access to this huge domestic market, and compared to that, overseas markets didn't look particularly attractive to them. They, they weren't com really competitive there, except in some sectors and a little bit later on. So, I, I, hopefully that answers your, your question. 1910, a number of sectors that were competitive, weren't they? Uh, by, which by, sectors by were competitive? By the end of your period, by like 1910, mm -hmm. 1914, there were sectors where it was competitive. There were some sectors that were competitive quite early. Uh, again, going back to that reciprocity convention that the National Association of Manufacturers held, uh, agricultural implements manufacturers are big proponents of the reciprocity treaty with France because they really did believe they were going to be able to export to France on a pretty large scale. It's the bulk of U.S. manufacturers that are not like the agricultural export sectors that block that. And I think later on, as you go forward in time, and especially after World War I, lots of U.S. manufacturers become more export-oriented and more internationally competitive. But before World War I, that's not really the case. Okay. Do you want to ask sure, sure. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand a bit more about the role of the tariff within broader imperial strategy, just because when you think of late 19th century foreign policy, you instantly think of Pan-Americanism or a plan to kind of dominate the Western Hemisphere. And so where does the tariff fit in within the broad kind of political context mm -hmm. of foreign policy making? Yeah, well, I think one of the, the central points I really want to make is that the, the tariff is what leads American foreign policymakers to believe that having exclusive access to Latin America would be a good idea. Uh, so when you're a protectionist, uh, because you, do, you don't believe your industries are, are competitive, you need to exclude the exports of other countries from areas you want to control. And that's really the core of the U.S. imperial strategy during this period, and it arises from trade protection. Now, the U.S. is not the only country that's pursuing this strategy. In fact, basically all imperial countries except Britain were pursuing, pursuing this kind of a tr uh, trade and sort of broader foreign policy strategy at the time. Um, and if you want to protect your home markets, it sort of pushes you in that direction of, of necessity. Well, let us thank our speaker uh, for a really interesting and challenging lecture and join us for reception and informal conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.